Hi, I'm Melanie Lipton, and this is a selection from the Iliad, as translated by Ian Johnston. Book 18, The Arms of Achilles. As the men fought on like a blazing fire raging, swift-footed Antilochus came to Achilles with his news. He found Achilles by his beaked ship, sensing in himself what had already happened, speaking with a troubled mind to his own great heart. Why are long-haired Achaeans once again retreating to their ships, being beaten back across the plain in terror? I hope the gods have not done something that will break my heart. My mother told me once they'd do that, when she told me that while I was alive the best man of the Myrmidons would leave the sun's light at the hands of Trojans. So it must be the case that the fine son of Menetius is dead, that reckless man. I told him to return back to the ships once he'd saved himself from consuming fire and not face up to Hector man to man. As Achilles in his mind and heart was thinking this, noble Nestor's son approached, shedding warm tears. He told him the agonizing truth. Son of warlike Peleus, you must hear this dreadful news. Something I wish weren't so. Patroclus lies dead. Men are fighting now around the body. He has been stripped. Hector, with his gleaming helmet, has the armor. Antilochus finished speaking. A black cloud of grief swallowed up Achilles. With both hands he scooped up soot and dust and poured it on his head, covering his handsome face with dirt, covering his sweet-smelling tunic with black ash. He lay sprawling. His mighty warrior's massive body collapsed and stretched out in the dust. With his hands he tugged at his own hair, disfiguring himself. The women slaves acquired as battle trophies by Achilles and Patroclus, hearts overwhelmed with anguish, began to scream aloud. They rushed outside and beat their breasts around warlike Achilles. Then all the women's legs gave way and they fell down. Across from them, Antilochus lamented, eyes full of tears, as he held Achilles by the hand. Achilles' noble heart moaned aloud. Antilochus feared he might hurt himself or slit his throat with his own sword. Achilles gave a huge cry of grief. His noble mother heard it from the ocean depths, where she was sitting by her ancient father. She began to wail. Then all around her gathered all the divine daughters of Nereus deep in the sea. Glauci, Thalea, Simodice, Nisaea, Spio, Thoe, Oxide, Halia, Simothui, Actea, Limnoria, Melite, Aera, Amphitui, Agave, Doto, Proto, Ferusa, Denomini, Dexamini, Amphidomi, Calianera, Doris, Panope, Lovely Galatea, Nomertes, Epsudis, Calianasa, also there were Clymene, Ianera, Ianasa, Myera, Orithia, Amathea with her lovely hair, and others, Nereus' daughters living in the ocean depths. They filled the glistening cave, beating their breasts. Thetis led them in all in their laments. Sister Nereids, listen, so all of you hearing what I say will understand my heart's enormous sorrow. Alas, for my unhappy misery, that to my grief I bore the best of men. For when I gave birth to a fine, strong boy to be an excellent, heroic warrior, when he'd grown tall as some young sapling, for I'd raised him like a lovely orchard tree, I sent him out in the beaked ships to Ilion to war against the Trojans. But now I'll never work, welcome him back home again, returning to the house of Peleus. While he's still alive and sees sunlight, he lives in sorrow. When I go to him, I can provide no help, but I shall go to look on my dear child, to hear what grief has overtaken him while he remains detached from all the fighting. With these words, Thetis left her cave. Her sisters went with her in tears. Around them the sea waves parted until they came to fertile Troy. They emerged climbing up on the shore, one after another, right where the Myrmidons had dragged their ships up in close-packed formation near swift Achilles. 
Then his noble mother moved beside him as he was groaning bitterly. With a sharp cry, she cradled her son's head, then spoke. As she grieved, she talked to him. Her words had wings. My child, why are you crying? What sorrow now has come into your heart? Speak out. Hide nothing. Zeus has given what you what you begged him to when you stretch out your hands to him. All Achaea's sons by their ship's sterns are hemmed in there, desperate for your help, suffering a terrible ordeal. With a heavy groan, swift-footed Achilles then answered Thetis, Yes, mother, Olympian Zeus has indeed accomplished what I asked. But what pleasure is there for me? When Patroclus, my beloved companion, has been destroyed, the man I honored as my equal above all other comrades, I've lost him and the armor which Hector took once, I'd killed, once he'd killed him, that massive armor so wonderful to look at, which the gods gave as a priceless gift to Peleus, on the day they placed you in the bed of a mortal man. If only you had stayed among the eternal maidens of the sea, and Peleus had married a mortal wife. But now there'll be innumerable sorrows waiting for your heart once your child is killed. You won't be welcoming him back home again. My own heart has no desire to live on, to continue living among men, unless Hector is hit by my spear first, losing his life and paying me compensation for killing Menetius's son, Patroclus. Through her tears, Thetis then answered Achilles, My son, from what you've just been saying, you're fated to an early death. For your doom comes quickly as soon as Hector dies. Swift-footed Achilles answered her with passion. Then let me die, since I could not prevent the death of my companion. He's fallen, far from his homeland. He needed me there to protect him from destruction. So now, since I'm not returning to my own dear land, and for Patroclus was no saving light, or for my many other comrades, all those killed... By God, like Hector, while I sat here by the ships, a useless burden on the earth. And I'm unmatched in warfare by any other Achaean armed in bronze, although in council other men are better. So let wars disappear from gods and men and passionate anger too, which incites even the prudent man to that sweet rage, sweeter than trickling honey in men's throats, which builds up like smoke inside their chest, as Agamemnon, king of men, just now made me enraged. <sighs> but we'll let that pass. For all the pain I feel, I'll suppress the heart within my chest, as I must. So now, I'll go to meet Hector, killer of the man I loved. As for my own fate, let it come to me when Zeus and the other deathless gods determine. For not even strong Hercules, the man Lord Zeus, son of Cronos, loved the most, escaped his death. He was destroyed by fate, and by malicious Hera's anger, too. And so, for me, if a like fate has been set, then once I am dead I'll just lie there. But for now, let me seize great glory. Let me make so many Trojan and Dardan matrons weep, and with both hands wipe tears from their soft cheeks, and set them on to constant lamentation, so they'll know I've long refrained from war. Don't keep me from battle. Though you love me, you'll not convince me. Silver-footed Thetis then said to Achilles, My child, what you say is true. It's no bad thing to protect companions when they've when they're threatened with complete disaster. But now, the Trojans have your lovely armor. All your glittering bronze, it's on the shoulders of Hector with the shining helmet. He boasts about it. But I do not think his triumph will last long, since his death is coming closer. But you must not rejoin Ares' conflict until, with your own eyes, you see me in the morning here again. I'll return at sunrise and I'll bring you lovely armor made by Lord Hephaestus. Saying this, 
Thetis turned away from her own son to address her ocean sisters. Now you must plunge into the broad lap of ocean and go find the old man of the sea in our father's house. Tell him everything. I'll go to High Olympus, to that famous artisan Hephaestus, to see if he is willing to give my son some splendid glittering armor. Thetis spoke. Her sisters quickly plunged under the waves. Then the silver-footed goddess Thetis went away to fetch the lovely armor from Olympus for her beloved son. As Thetis's feet carried her back towards Olympus, Achaeans were running back with a huge noise, fleeing man-killing Hector, until they reached their ships beside the Hellespont. But those well-armed Achaeans could not extricate Achilles's comrade, dead Patroclus, from the spears, for they'd overta been overtaken by Trojan warriors and chariots once again, with Hector, Priam's son, as furious as fire. Three times glorious Hector, from behind, seized the corpse's feet, keen to drag it off, shouting furiously to his Trojans. Three times the two Ajaxes, clothed in their full battle strength, beat him from the corpse. But Hector kept on coming without a pause, confident of his fighting power. Sometimes he charged right at them in the frenzied crowd. Sometimes he just stood there and gave a mighty yell, but he never yielded any ground. Just as shepherds are unable to drive off from their farmyard, a tawny, ravenous, ravenous lion by some carcass. So the two warrior Ajaxes could not push Hector, Priam's son, back from that body. And now Hector would have seized the, seized the corpse, winning infinite glory, if swift Iris, with feet like the wind, had not come down speeding from Olympus to the son of Peleus, with a message that he should arm himself for war. Hera had sent her, unknown to Zeus and the other gods. Standing by Achilles, Iris spoke. Her words had wings. Rouse yourself, son of Peleus, most feared of men, defend Patroclus. For on his behalf a deadly conflict rages by the ships. Men are butchering each other, some trying to protect the dead man's corpse, while others, the Trojans, charge in to carry it away to windy Ilion. The one most eager to haul, haul the body off is glorious Hector, whose heart is set on hacking off the head from its soft neck. He'll fix it on a stake set in the wall. So get up, no more lying here. Your heart will be disgraced if Patroclus becomes a plaything for the dogs of Troy. His mutilated corpse will be your shame. Swift-footed godlike Achilles then asked her, Goddess Iris, which of the gods sent you with this message to me? Swift Iris, with feet like the wind, then said to Achilles, Hera sent me. Zeus's glorious wife, Cronus's son who sits on high, doesn't know. Nor do any of the other immortal gods, inhabiting snow-capped Olympus. Swift-footed Achilles then questioned Iris. But how can I rejoin that conflict? Those men have my armor. My dear mother has told me not to arm myself for war, not until my own eyes see that she's come back. She promised to bring me splendid armor from Hephaestus. I don't know anyone whose glorious equipment I could use, with the exception of the shield of Ajax, son of Telamon. But I expect he's out there with his spear, among the front-line warriors in that conflict over dead Patroclus. Wind-swift Iris then answered Achilles, We know well enough your lovely armor is in Trojan hands, but you should go now, just as you are, to the ditch. Show yourself to Trojans. It may happen that the Trojans, afraid of you, will pull back from battle, giving Achaea's exhausted warlike sons a breathing space, for rests in war are rare. With these words, swift-footed Iris went away. Then Achilles, loved by Zeus, moved into action. Around his powerful shoulders, Athena set her tasseled aegis. Then the lovely goddess wrapped his head in a golden cloud, so from him a fiery light blazed out. Just like those times when smoke from a city stretches all the way to heaven, 
rising in the distance from an island under siege by an enemy, where men fight all day long in Ares' hateful war, struggling for their city. Then at sunset they light fires one by one, beacons flaming upward to erect att erect attract attention from those on nearby islands. So their ships will come to save them from destruction. That's how the light blazed then, from Achilles' head right up to heaven. He strode from the wall, then stood there by the ditch. But recalling what his mother had said to him, he did not mingle with Achaeans. As he stood there, he cried out. From far away, Pallas Athena added her voice too, causing great consternation among the Trojans. As thrilling as a trumpet's note when it rings clearly, when rapacious enemies besiege a city, that's how sharp and piercing Achilles' voice was then. When the Trojans heard it, that brazen shout Achilles gave, all their hearts were shaken. Their horses, with their lovely manes, turned back the chariots, anticipating trouble in their hearts. Charioteers were terrified, seeing the fearful, inextinguishable fire blazing from the head of the great-hearted son of Peleus. For Athena, goddess with the glittering eyes, kept it burning. Three times godlike Achilles yelled across that ditch. Three times Trojans and their allies were thrown into confusion. At that moment, twelve of their best men were killed by their own chariots and their own spears. Achaeans then, with stronger hearts, pulled Patroclus out of spear range and laid him on a cot. His dear companions gathered mourning round him, Achilles with them, shedding hot tears when he saw his loyal companion lying on a deathbed, mutilated by sharp bronze. He'd sent him out to war with chariot and horses, but never welcomed him at his return. Then ox-eyed Queen Hera made the unwearied sun, against his will, go down into the stream of ocean. So the sun set. Godlike Achaeans could now pause for some relief from the destructive killing of impartial war. For their part, once Trojans drew back from the harsh fight, they untied swift horses from their chariots, and then, before they thought of food, called for a meeting. There, everyone stayed standing. No one dared sit down, all terrified because Achilles had appeared after his long absence from the savage conflict. The first to speak was Polydamus, Panthus's son, a prudent man, the only one who weighed with care the past and future. He was Hector's comrade, both born on the same night. As a public speaker, he was the better of the two, but Hector far surpassed him with a spear. Bearing in mind their common good, Polydamus addressed them. My friends, consider both sides of this issue. For my part, I advise us to return into the city. We should not stay here on the plain, waiting for dawn beside the ships. Our walls are far away. While Achilles kept up his anger at Lord Agamemnon, Achaeans were, were easier to fight against. Personally, I was glad to spend the night by their swift ships, hoping that we'd capture the, those curved vessels. But now I really have a dreadful fear of Peleus's swift-footed son. He has a reckless heart. He's not a man to rest content in the middle of the plain, where Trojans and Achaeans have a share of Ares's battle fury. No, he'll fight on for our city and our women. So let's go back, return into the city. Trust me when I say that's how things will go. For now, sacred night has stopped the swift-footed son of Peleus. But if tomorrow he moves into action fully armed and encounters us still here, we'll recognize him well enough. Anyone who gets away and makes it back to Ilion will be a happy man. For dogs and vultures will eat many Trojans. I don't want to hear that such events have happened. If we all follow my advice, although reluctantly, tonight we'll collect our forces in one group. Walls, high gates, and doors with fitted planks, polished and bolted shut, will guard the city. But in the morning early, we'll arm ourselves, then take up our position on the walls. If Achilles comes from the ships, keen to fight for our walls. 
then he'll be disappointed. He'll go back to his ships once he's worn out his strong-necked horses with too much running, scampering around below our city wall. His heart won't let him force his way inside, and he'll not lay waste our city, not before our swift dogs eat him up for dinner. With a scowl, Hector of the Flashing Helmet replied, Polydamus, what you say displeases me. You tell us to run back to the city and stay inside it. Haven't you already been cooped up long enough within these walls? In earlier days, all mortal men would claim that Priam City was rich in gold and bronze. But now those splendid treasures are all gone. Many goods from our own homes we've sold. They went to Phrygia or Firmaconia. Once great Zeus in anger turned against us. But now... When crooked-minded Kronos' son allows me to win glory by the ships, hemming the Achaeans in beside the sea, this is no time, you fool, to say such things before the people. Not a single Trojan will take your advice. I won't permit it. But come, let's all follow now what I suggest. You must take your dinner at your stations all through the army, making sure you watch with every man awake. Any Trojan too concerned about his property should gather it up and give it to the men for common use. Better that one of us gets use from it than that Achaeans do. Tomorrow morning, early, right at dawn, we'll fully arm ourselves with weapons, then take keen battle to those hollow ships. If indeed it's true that Lord Achilles is returning to that battle by the ships, if he wants that, so much the worse for him. I won't run from him in painful battle, but stand against him, fighting face to face. Whether great victory goes to him or me. In war, the odds are equal. And the man who seeks to kill may well be killed himself. Hector spoke. The Trojans roared out in response. The fools! Pallas Athena had robbed them of their wits. They all applauded Hector's disastrous tactics. No one praised Polydamus, who advised them well. Then throughout the army, they ate their dinner. Meanwhile, Achaeans mourned Patroclus all night long with their elegies. Among them, Peleus' son began the urgent lamentations, placing his murderous hands on the chest of his companion, with frequent heavy groans like a bearded lion when a deer hunter in dense forests steals its cubs. The lion comes back later, then, sick at heart, roams through the many clearings of the forest, tracking the man's footprints in hope of finding him, as bitter anger overwhelms the beast. Just like that, Achilles, amid his groans, addressed his myrmidons. Alas, what a useless promise I made then, the day I tried to cheer Menetius up at home, telling him when I'd sacked Ilion, I'd bring his splendid son back there to him in Opesis, and with his share of trophies. But Zeus does not bring fulfillment all things which men propose. Now both of us share a common fate, to redden the same earth right here in Troy. Old horseman Peleus will not be welcoming me at my return back to his home, nor will my mother Thetis. For in this place... The earth will cover me. And now, Patroclus, since I'm journeying under the earth after you, I'll postpone your burial till I bring here Hector's head. His armor, too. The man who slaughtered you, you courageous man. I'll cut the throats of twelve fine Trojan children on your pyre in my anger at your killing. Till that time you'll lie this, like this, with me by my beaked ships, and round you, Trojan and Dardanian women will keep lamenting night and day, shedding tears, the very women we worked hard to win with our strength and our long spears by looting prosperous cities of mortal men. After these words, godlike Achilles told his comrades to place a large tripod on the fire so they could wash the blood clots from his comrades' corpse. On the blazing fire... They set a cauldron with three legs, poured water in it, then brought split wood to burn below the water. Fire licked the cauldron's belly and made the water hot. 
Once it had boiled inside the shining bronze, they washed him, rubbed oil thickly over him, and filled his wounds with ointment nine days old. Then they placed Patroclus on a bed, covering him with a fine woolen cloth from head to foot, and a white cloak on the cloth. Then all night long the Myrmidons around swift-footed Achilles mourned Patroclus with their lamentations. Then Zeus spoke to Hera, his sister and his wife, You've got what you wanted, ox-eyed Queen Hera. Swift-footed Achilles, you've spurred into action. From your own womb you must have given birth to those long-haired Achaeans. Ox-eyed Queen Hera then replied to Zeus, Most dread son of Kronos, what are you saying? Even a human man, though mortal, mortal and ignorant of what I know, can achieve what he intends for someone else. And men say I'm the finest of all goddesses in a double sense, both by my lineage and my marriage to the ruler of the gods. So why should I not bring an evil fortune on these Trojans when they've made me angry? Thus the two converse with one another then. Meanwhile, silver-footed Thetis reached Hephaestus' home. Made of eternal bronze and gle gleaming like a star, it stood out among the homes of the immortals. The crippled god had constructed it himself. She found him working with his bellows, moving round, sweating in his eager haste. He was forging twenty tripods in all to stand along the walls of his well-built house. Under the legs of each one he had fitted golden wheels so every tripod might move all on its own into a gathering of the gods at his command and then return to his own house. They were wonderful to look at, his work on them had reached the stage where finely crafted handles had still not been attached. He was making those, forging the rivets. As he was work on, working on them with his great skill, silver-footed goddess Thetis approached more closely. Noticing her, Charis, lovely goddess with a splendid veil, came forward. She was wife to the celebrated crippled god. Taking Thetis by the hand, she called her name and said, Long-robed Thetis, why visit our house now? You're a welcome and respected guest, but to this point you haven't come by very much. Do step inside, let me show you our hospitality. With these words, the goddess led her inside the house. She asked Thetis to, to sit in a still silver-studded chair, beautifully finished, with a footstool underneath it. Then she called the famous artisan Hephaestus. Come here, Hephaestus, Thetis needs to see you. The celebrated lame god then replied to Charis, Here's a fearful, honored goddess in my home, the one who saved me when I was in pain after my great fall. Thanks to my mother, that shameless one eager to conceal me because I was a cripple. At that time I would have suffered heartfelt agonies if Thetis and Eronymy daughter of circling ocean stream, had not taken me into their hearts. With those two, for nine years, I made many lovely things, brooches, spiral bracelets, earrings, necklaces, inside their hollow cave. The ocean stream flowed round me, always with the roar of surf. No one else knew, neither God nor mortal man. But Thetis and Euronymy, the ones who rescued me, they knew. And now Thetis has come to my home, so I must give her full recompense. Fair-haired Thetis saved my life. But Charis, now show her our hospitality. I'll put away my bellows and my tools. Huge god Hephaestus got up from the anvil block with labored breathing. He was lame, but his thin legs moved quickly under him. He placed his bellows far from the fire and collected all his work tools, then stored them in a silver chest. With a sponge, he wiped his face, both hands, thick neck, and hairy chest. Then he pulled on a tunic and came limping out, gripping a sturdy staff. At once, he was helped along by female servants made of gold who moved to him. They looked like living servant girls, possessing minds, hearts with intelligence, vocal cords, and strength. They learned to work from the immortal gods. These women served to give their master detailed help. Hephaestus came limping up to Thetis and sat down in a shining chair. Then, clasping her hand, he spoke. Long-robed Thetis, why have you come here to our house, an honored, welcome guest? 
To this point, you haven't come here often. But see what's on your mind. My heart tells me I shall do it if I can accomplish it, if it's something that can be carried out. Thetis answered him in tears. Oh, Hephaestus, is there any goddess on Olympus who suffered so much painful sorrow in her heart to equal the unhappiness that Zeus, son of Cronus, loads on me more than any other god? Of all goddesses living in the sea, he made me subject to a mortal man, Peleus, son of Achaeus. So I had to put up with a man in bed, though much against my will. Now he lies there in his home, worn out by harsh old age, and I still have more pain. He gave me a son to bear and raise in his out, as an outstanding warrior. The boy grew up as quickly as a sapling. Then, when I had reared him like a tree in a fertile garden, I sent him off in the beaked ships to fight at Ilion against the Trojans. I'll never welcome him returning home to the house of Peleus. And while he still lives to glimpse the sunlight, he lives in sorrow. When I visit him, I cannot help him. Achaea's sons chose for him as his prize a girl whom great Agamemnon seized right out of his arms. In grief for her, his heart has pined away. And the Trojans penned Achaeans in their in by their ship's sterns, not letting him, them come out. The senior, senior men among the Argives pleaded with my son. They promised splendid gifts, but he refused, declining to protect them from disaster. But then he sent Patroclus to the war, dressing him in his own armor, providing a force of many men. They fought all day around the Scian gates, and that very day would have utterly destroyed the city if Apollo had not killed Menetius' son after he had inflicted his bloody carnage. He killed him at the front, giving Hector all the glory. That's why I've come here now, asking at your knees if you'd be willing to give my son, who is fated to die soon, a shield, helmet, good leg armor fitted with ankle clasps, and body armor, too. His previous equipment was all taken when Trojans killed his loyal companion. Now my son lies in the dust, heart filled with pain. The famous crippled god then answered Thetis, Cheer up. Don't let these things afflict your heart. I wish I could hide him from distressful death when his cruel fate arrives, as surely as I know there'll be fine armor for him. Such splendid armor that it will astound all the many men who have chance to see it. With these words, Hephaestus left her there, going to start his bellows. He directed them right at the fire, then told them to start working. So the bellows, twenty in all, started blowing on the crucibles, each one emitting just the right amount of air sometimes blowing hard to help when he was busy, sometimes gently, whichever way Hephaestus wished, so his work could go on ahead. He threw on the fire, enduring bronze and tin, precious gold and silver. Then he placed the great anvil on its block, took up a massive hammer in one hand, and in the other his tongs. The first thing he created was a huge and sturdy shield, all wonderfully crafted. Around its edge, he fixed a triple rim glittering in the light, attaching to it a silver carrying strap. The shield had five layers. On the outer one, with his great skill, he fashioned many rich designs. There he hammered out the earth, the heavens, the sea, the untiring sun, the moon at the full, along with every constellation which crowns the heavens, the Pleiades, the Hyades, mighty Orion and the bear, which some people call the wing, always circling in the same position, watching Orion, the only stars that never bathe in ocean stream. Then he created two splendid cities of mortal men. In one there were feasts and weddings. By the light of blazing torches, people were leading the brides out from their homes and through the town to loud music of the bridal song. There were young lads dancing, whirling to the constant tunes of flutes and lyres, lyres, <laughs> while all the women stood beside their doors, staring in admiration. Then the people gathered in the assembly, for a dispute had taken place. 
Two men were arguing about blood money owed for a murdered man. One claimed he'd paid in full, setting out his case before the people, but the other was refusing any compensation. Both were keen to receive the judgment from an arbitration. The crowd there cheered them on, some supporting one, some the other, while heralds kept the throng controlled. Meanwhile, elders were sitting on the, there on the polished stones in the sacred circle, holding in their hands the staffs they'd taken from the clear-voiced heralds. With those, they'd stand up there and render judgment, each in his turn. In the center lay two gold talents to be awarded to the one among them all who would deliver the most righteous verdict. The second city was surrounded by two armies, soldiers with glittering weapons. They were discussing two alternatives, each one pleasing some of them, whether to attack the city and plunder it, or to accept as payment half of all the goods contained in that fair town. But those under siege who disagreed were arming for a secret ambush. Their dear wives and children stood up on the walls as a defense, along with those too old to fight. The rest were leaving, led by Pallas Athena and Ares, both made of gold, dressed in golden clothes, large, beautiful, and armed, as is suitable for gods. They stood out above the smaller people with them. When the soldiers reached a spot which seemed all right for ambush, a place beside the river where the cattle came to drink, they stopped there, covered in shining bronze. Two scouts were stationed some distance from that army, waiting to catch sight of sheep and short-horned cattle. These soon appeared, followed by two herdsmen playing their flutes and not anticipating any danger. But those lying in ambush, in ambush saw them and rushed out, quickly cutting off the herds of cattle and fine flocks of white-fleeced sheep, killing the herdsmen with them. When the besiegers, sitting in their meeting place, heard the great commotion coming from the cattle, they quickly climbed up behind their prancing horses and set out. They soon caught up with those attackers. Then they organized themselves for battle and fought along the river banks, men hitting one another with bronze-tipped spears. Strife and confusion joined the fight, along with cruel death, who seized one wounded man while still alive, and then another man without a wound, while pulling the feet of one more corpse from the fight. The clothes death wore around her shoulders were dyed red with human blood. They even joined the slaughter as living mortals, fighting there and hauling off the bodies of dead men which each of them had killed. On that shield Hephaestus next set a soft and fallow field, fertile, spacious farmland, which had been plowed three times. Many laborers were wheeling plows across it, moving back and forth. As they reached the field's edge, they turned, and a man came up to offer them a cup of wine as sweet as honey. Then they turned back down the furrow, eager to move through that deep soil and reach the field's end once again. The land behind them was black, looking as though it had just been plowed, though it was made of gold, an amazing piece of work. Then he pictured on the shield a king's landed estate where harvesters were reaping corn using sharp sickles. Armfuls of corn were falling on the ground in rows, one after the other. Binders were tying them up in sheaves, with twisted straw. Three binders stood there. Behind the reapers, boys were gathering the crop, bringing it to the sheaf binders, keeping them busy. Among them stood a king, scepter in hand there by the stubble, saying nothing but with pleasure in his heart. Some distance off, under an oak tree, heralds were setting up a feast, dressing a huge ox which they'd just killed. Women were sprinkling white barley on the meat in large amounts for the workers' meal. Next, Hephaestus placed on the shield a vineyard, full of grapes made of splendid gold. The grapes were black. The poles supporting vines throughout were silver. Around it, he made a ditch of blue enamel. Around that, a fence of tin. A single path led in, where the grape pickers came and went at harvest time. Young girls and carefree lads with wicker baskets were carrying off a crop as sweet as honey. In the middle of them all, a boy with a clear-toned lyre played pleasant music, singing the song of Linos in his delicate, fine voice. His comrades kept time, beating the ground behind him, singing and dancing. 
Then he set on the shield a herd of straight-horned cattle, with cows crafted out of gold and tin. They were lowing as they hurried out from farm to pasture land, beside a rippling river lined with waving reeds. The herdsmen walking by the cattle, four of them, were also made of gold. Nine swift-footed dogs ran on behind. But there, at the front of the herd, two fearful lions had seized a bellowing bull. They were dragging him off as he roared aloud. The dogs and young men were chasing after them. The lions, after ripping open the great ox's hide, were gorging on its entrails, on its black blood, as herdsmen kept trying in vain to chase them off, setting their swift dogs on them. But fearing the lions, the dogs kept turning back before they nipped at them, and stood there barking, close but out of reach. Then the famous crippled god created there a pasture in a lovely valley bottom, an open ground for white-fleeced sheep, sheepfolds, roofed huts, and pens. Next on that shield, the celebrated lame god made an elaborately crafted dancing floor, like the one Daedalus created long ago in spacious Knossos for Ariadne with the lovely hair. On that floor, young men and women whose bride price would require many cattle were dancing, holding on to one another by the wrists. The girls wore fine linen dresses. The men, lightly rubbed with oil, wore woven tunics. On their heads, the girls had lovely flower garden garlands. The men were carrying gold daggers on silver straps. They turned with such graceful ease on skilled feet. Just as a potter sits with a wheel between his hands, testing it to make sure it runs smoothly. Then they would line up and run towards each other. A large crowd stood around, enjoying the dancing magic, as in the middle two acrobats led the dance, springing and whirling and tumbling. On that shield, Hephaestus then depicted Ocean, the mighty river, flowing all around the outer edge. When he created that great and sturdy shield, he fashioned body armor brighter than blazing fire, a heavy helmet shaped to fit Achilles' temples, beautiful and finely worked, with a gold crest on top. Then he made him leg guards of finely hammered tin. When the famous lame guard, God, had made all the armor, he took it and set it there before Achilles' mother. Then, like a hawk, she sped down from Olympus, carrying the gleaming armor of Hephaestus.